This is what it means, Joseph said. Three baskets in three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift, will lift off your head and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat away your flesh. Now on the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, so that once again put the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. He doesn't that figure, you know? Anyway, and you know what? I, 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 I know that we say it figures, and even I feel that way, but at the same time, there's a couple things you have to consider about that. The first is that it wasn't time for Joseph to come out of the jail. God had a specific time that he would come out of the jail, and we know that already. But the second thing is you got to figure that this guy has been in trouble with Pharaoh. He's been in jail, and the last thing in the world that anybody would want to do when they get out of jail is to make more trouble. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's human nature. Oh, there's a guy in here that's innocent, and he interpreted the dreams, and, and uh, you know, Pharaoh would be like, don't send him to jail. Send him to the insane asylum. You know what I mean? I, he just, he probably, I, I, I don't want to defend the guy, but at the same time, and the Bible does say he forgot him. So, you know, it's a little, little more serious, but he, he, did he forget him intentionally? I probably would have done the same thing if I was this guy. That's all. I'm just not trying to defend him. Anyway, in Deuteronomy 21, verse 22, it says, If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on that day, so you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged on a tree is accursed of God. Okay, so... This goes back to this guy being hung on a tree. Um, I don't know if they took him off a tree at night or not because this was Egypt. But if you go to the New Testament and it says that Jesus was on the cross and the two guys next to him and then um, Jesus died, okay, but the other two people were still alive and they would have been alive. So rather than leaving him on the cross, they went and broke their legs so that they would suffocate very quickly. Okay, they couldn't push up anymore against the nails and so their lungs would have immediately filled up with fluid and they would have died. But that was a practice that they would try to follow. Now, obviously this was a Roman execution and they couldn't give diddly about the law. But uh, in Israel, when they had somebody that was executed and they hung him on a tree, it always makes a point of saying they took him off before sunrise. Okay, even an enemy. Uh, they, that's just what they did. They, they treated the bodies with respect. But anyway, Jesus was hung on a tree because, as it says, Cursed is he, um, for he who is hanged on a tree is a cursed of God. Well, if you go to Galatians, and it's probably chapter 3, and you don't have to go there, I'll, I'll read it to you, but Galatians 3 or 4, right in this area, it says here, um, just because we're talking about hanging on a tree, um, uh, I'll start with verse 10. It says, For as many as are of the works of the law under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which were written in the law, the book of the law, to do them. And Moses said that. He says, Cursed is anyone who doesn't do the things that are in the book of the law. Well, nobody can do the, everything in the book of the law, so everybody's cursed. That's the point that Paul is making in Galatians. But then he says, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. The law demands works, but God says you're justified by faith. So not only are you condemned by the law, but the very fact that you're trying to obtain God's favor by the law that he gave you brings about a curse in itself. He says you need to live by faith and not by the law. Then he goes on in uh, verse 13. He says, curse, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He's saying that Jesus Christ fulfilled the law perfectly, thereby fulfilling it on our behalf, but then even after he perfectly fulfilled the law, he was cursed because he was hung on a tree and cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. He became our curse even though he didn't deserve it because he fulfilled the law. Does everybody see that? It's marvelous how God worked this out. The law needed to be fulfilled. If the law wasn't fulfilled, then we wouldn't be sitting here free from sin. That's all there is to it. So Jesus fulfilled the law. And then after he fulfilled the law, they hung him to a tree, which brought about a curse for us. Everything he did was for us. Every single thing that Jesus did 
was for us. Anyway, didn't mean to get off too far, but we talked about a guy hanging on a tree, so, yep. Uh, why, why was the chief baker had his head chopped off and the other was returned to... Probably what happened is there was a time of investigation when they were, something happened in the court is my guess. Somebody stole something, somebody did something, and what they did is they were investigating them. And they probably said, well, it was the chief baker. They probably finished, it doesn't say that in the Bible, but that's, that's the only thing I can think of. Is that, and once again, that's not my own thoughts, that actually came from the same movie. You know, people think things through, they probably read rabbinic commentaries and people that have thought these things through over the years, but that makes sense as to why these two guys were in jail in the first place. They were both put in jail at the same time and then a sentence was executed on one but not the other. It tells you that probably there was an offense against Pharaoh and he had them in there until he could determine what the offense was. So that's what it is. Anyway, um, got hung on a tree for it. Take care, Dave. Yeah, all right. So anyway, a anybody please, 41-1. <clears throat> oh. For two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile when out of the river came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and then grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came out of the Nile and stood beside those on the riverbank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. And then Pharaoh woke, uh, woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted thin and scorched by the east wind. Okay, before you go on, and this is going to explain itself, so there's no point in going into it, but the east wind... Has, other than mom, has anybody else been to Israel or the Mideast? They have what's called the Kamsin winds. And it is, yeah, do, did you all see the pictures of the dust storms over uh, Arizona in the past week or two? They had a couple of them, which is rare enough, but they had two within a month. Um, they have these, these uh, dust storms out there. Well, they have the same thing in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. But these are mostly brought on by an east wind, and it is an exceptionally hot wind. The calm scene wind can make everything literally wither away in a single day. It's hot enough over there already, but when this calm scene wind starts blowing, it takes all the life out of everything. And throughout history, we will hear of times when these winds came about. You'll, you'll, you'll read about in the book of, uh, um, what's his name, Jonah. He's sitting under the, the thing and the, the thing comes up. Well, it talks about the east wind. That's the calm scene. Anyway, um, you can see God's hand working in this is when the crusaders went down into the Holy Land. They, uh, and I'm going to get the story wrong to some extent, but it, it's general uh, idea of what happened is the crusaders were down there. Of course, everybody thinks God's on their side. That's, you know, if you're in battle, God is on our side. Well, they're down there, they're carrying the cross, and they're wearing all of their heavy armor. They're wearing, um, you know, they, they travel very heavy like, they walk a lot, they have people that are mounted on big horses. But everything is very slow and cumbersome. But they are well protected, okay? Then comes the armies of Salahuddin, the, the guy that, uh, the, the great Muslim that regained Jerusalem and he regained uh, all of the lands which eventually became the uh, Ottoman Empire. And they, on the other hand, travel very lightly. They have little horses that are very sprite. The guys don't wear any armor. If they do wear any armor, it's a few of the people, but most of the people are very mobile. And... Um, uh, so they're out there, and at the time of this great battle that was going on, the calm scene wind started. And there was, there was no water available at the time. They, they had exhausted all of their water, and it says that the people were begging to die as they were taking off their armor, and they were literally in tears, weeping at their agony. And then Salahuddin, what he does is he went around them, and all of this grass which had dried up from these winds, he set it on fire and just roasted these guys to death. So that's the story of, but God, you can see how he is working in history, sending uh, uh, climate changes for his purposes. If you look at, I don't think it's 
any stroke of the imagination to say that George Washington was protected going across the Potomac by that fog that, that got him over there. Nobody saw him. They went in. It happened to be on Christmas evening. The people were sleeping late the next morning. They went in there and they, they won the Battle of Trenton. This country is here because of God's sovereign purposes. And you can see when he retreated from New York, the same thing happened. There was fog. There was all these things. And how the weather played a part in George Washington's actual escapades or whatever you call them. And throughout history, just because people make choices doesn't mean that God doesn't know what the choices are going to be and he will have the weather conditions so that things will prevail the way that he wants it. You know, as it says, um, I, the Psalms say it, it says it in uh, the book of uh, Deuteronomy, that why would one be able to chase a thousand unless the Lord had sold them out, right? Okay, so uh, when these things happen, we think that God is on our side, but when in fact his purposes are not yet meant to be. And Israel is not ready to go back into the land. It's going to be another thousand, two thousand years, whatever, of punishment for Israel. And so the land stays barren. Of course, the Muslims aren't going to go in there and cultivate it. So it just laid fallow all of those years the way that God predicted. And then he planted Israel at the right time. But that's the way of the world. We make our choices about where we're going to go, but God frust that frustrates them for his purposes. You know, that's just the way it is. So they had a choice to stay in their land and work on their vine trees in France, or they could have gone off to war and thought we're going to do the battle. Well, that's not the way that God wants it. And so, you know, the people that stayed in France kept their life or England or wherever they were. But just a, a little side issue there, just so you can see how these things work. But this is the wind that it's talking about, the Khamsin wind, K-H-A-M-S-H-I-N or S-I-I-N or something like that. Anyway, um, but that's the wind that it's being described. And we know that is because it lasts and it lasts and it lasts seven years. And it actually is fulfilled in a couple chapter or paragraphs. But anyway, go ahead. The ten heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy foreheads. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. In the morning his mind was troubled, so he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. And then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I am reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once again was uh, angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Uh, each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now, a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. He told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them. I was restored to my position, and the other man was hanged. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. And when he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said that, that uh, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Next verse is another good verse as to the faithfulness of Joseph. Go ahead. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answers he desires. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows, fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds. So why did they come out of the river? He says the cows came out of the river. Why did the cows come out of the river? Because the Nile is what gives life to Egypt. In other words, anything that comes out, whether it's you know, the, the animals or the, the grain or anything, the Nile is what provides the initial life for it. And that's why they came out of the river. He's standing on the Nile. The Nile is the point where life is springing out. And that's all through the Bible. I mean, the tree that stands by the water will not be harmed when, you know, you know Jeremiah talks about it, Isaiah talks about it, is that when you're planted by a river, that's where you're sustenance comes from. And that goes all the way to the very last chapter of the Bible, and it was in the first couple chapters of the Bible. There's great rivers, there's life around them, and it says in the book of Revelation that, that you have the river that's coming out, clear as the water of life or whatever, and you know, the 12 trees on both sides with the bare fruit each month, for, and the healing is for the, the leaves are for the healing of the nations. But they come out of the river because that's the source of life. Okay? That's why. Go ahead. After them, seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. Okay, 
They came up out of the river and they're scrawny, ugly, and mean. What does that tell you? <laughs> well, it tells you that the, the Nile is drying up. That's right. There's no water coming down from the dry, which means that this isn't just this isn't just a local thing. The Nile goes way, way, way back up. You know, it's it goes way up into like where's Ethiopia or Sudan or somewhere is where it starts.